You know, it's something I noticed. I was thinking about this when I was listening to uh, Alvin Bragg and his uh, cohorts with their post-conviction press conference yesterday. All chatty, smiling with the media, banter back and forth. <laughs> A lovely day. Uh, what I've noticed is that the people who most often utter the phrase, no one is above the law, are the people who believe themselves to be above the law. And Alvin Bragg is such a person, a modern-day Thomas Dewey, to hear him tell it. In the 1930s, District Attorney Thomas Dewey ushered in the era of the modern, independent, professional prosecutor. For now nearly 90 years, dedicated professionals in this office have built upon that fine tradition. But uh, even though he's uh, 21st century Thomas Dewey, who was a Republican, Republican, by the way, yes, uh, uh, you know, ran against FDR, Truman. Uh, anyway, uh, even though uh, he is a modern day Thomas Dewey, the uh, heroic independent prosecutor, please, 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 enough about me. Don't call him a hero. He doesn't need it. He does things humbly. I want to thank this phenomenal prosecution team embodying oh, the finest traditions of this office, professionalism, mm. integrity, oh, yeah. dedication, and service. Uh, they are model public servants, uh, and I am proud and humbled to serve side by side with them. Mm. Integrity, professionalism, public service. Uh, for more on this, we're pleased to be joined by Joseph Moreno, former federal prosecutor with the Department of Justice in the National Security Division a former staff member with the FBI's 9-11 Review Commission and a U.S. Army combat veteran. Joseph Moreno, thanks for joining us again. Appreciate it. Good morning, Dan. Good to be with you. Um, do you think those adjectives that uh, Alvin Bragg used to describe himself and his colleagues are accurate? I, I think it's grotesque, frankly, Dan. I mean, a, a few decades ago, had, had a prosecutor run for office promising that when he's elected, he would go after his political enemies, that would have been a disqualifier. There's, under any basic legal ethics, that should bar you from holding that office. And yet, Alvin Bragg is holding it like a trophy. I mean, I have no doubt in the next decade, he'll be New York's governor. I mean, this, this to him will be the crowning accomplishment of his career. And, I, you know, I've been in the weeds in this case for the last six weeks, commenting on it and watching it. But Taking a step back, for 300 million Americans looking at this, how could you not conclude that this was a targeted prosecution of a political enemy? I mean, this, it's a six-year-old case. Barely can understand it. I mean, it, the, the ball was really hidden until the very end, and it was, it, was, it was baked from the beginning. I mean, if there was any doubt about how things were going to turn out uh, – on Wednesday, I was still optimistic that maybe the jury will see through this, but those jury instructions, that were the icing on the cake. There was no way that the jury was going to not find a guilty verdict because Judge Murchon just gave them so many ways to get there, and it was so unclear. I have no doubt they were spinning. They were so confused. Although you did have two lawyers on the jury, so I, I don't know. The confusion argument doesn't uh, – I, mean, I don't find that terribly persuasive, particularly because, as you suggest – there was no there there in the beginning here. The witnesses were not particularly credible. And so even if you had to make your way through this Rube Goldberg, 55 pages worth of jury instructions, you still should have known better. But I, I want to start with the jury instructions and then get your perspective, um, being a former federal prosecutor, that if you were part of the uh, Trump defense team and you were cobbling together an appeal, what uh, grounds you would be particularly focused upon? Well, I mean, I think there's half a dozen diff different grounds, uh, starting from the beginning of the case to the very end at the jury instructions. Uh, I, I think working backward, it's this notion that the jurors did not have to identify a discrete crime associated with this alleged accounting irregularity. The New York statute is vague. However, the history shows that it should be a New York law and it should be definitive. And it should be explained, it should be identified to the defense at the beginning of the trial so they can prepare an adequate defense. So the idea that, remember, when this case was charged a year ago, Alvin Bragg was asked right on the spot when this indictment came out, 
what is the corresponding crime? And he was very cagey about it. And remember, he kind of muttered something about federal election law, and he, he really never would commit to it. And then throughout the trial, again, they were kind of cagey. They kind of referenced federal election law, and we're all scratching our heads saying, wait a minute, you're a state prosecutor. You don't have jurisdiction over federal campaign finance laws. That's the Department of Justice and the Federal Election Commission. And yet only in his closing arguments, which of course were after the defense rests because the defense goes first in closing arguments in New York, then Bragg's team finally reveals that it's federal campaign finance law as one of the three hooks, another one being tax law. I mean, how could the defense possibly mount a defense in an alleged tax law scheme if never told about it? And the one witness the defense tried to call, who was a campaign finance expert, who would have testified that this entire structure doesn't even, is not even consider a campaign contribution, he was barred from testifying. So the jury wasn't even allowed to hear the ins and outs of campaign finance law. And so that's where I would start. I think the jury instructions completely obliterated any possibility of fairness here. So what this is going to go to, to it's going to be appealed, and what is that process going to look like, and how long is it going to take? Well, Amy, it, it won't be quick. So right, up, right away, the defense team will appeal to the, the first level appellate court in New York, which is the appellate division. Uh, it'll, it'll stagnate there for a while, uh, and then depending on how that goes, that would go to the ultimate court in New York State, which is called the Court of Appeals. Um, at the same time, the defense can appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court because there are constitutional issues here, as well as deficiencies in New York state law. Now, normally the Supreme Court will want to see an appeal work its way through the state system first before they'll take it. There are instances where the court can reach in and take it immediately without waiting for the state. That's really unusual. And so that'll be a big question as to how extreme the U.S. Supreme Court thinks these abuses were, and coupled with the fact that we're in the middle of a federal election season, so which I think adds a absolute level of um, importance to this, per- this process because we're really now further distorting Donald Trump's ability to run for president. Right, and so uh, the, the, that Supreme Court piece, and so first of all, they can file appeals concurrently Right. Uh, They can file an appeal uh, with the New York State Appellate Court and they can also make this appeal to the Supreme Court uh, uh, simultaneously. Yes. Correct. Dan. And so uh, you try to get this before the court before they adjourn June 30th, which shouldn't be a problem. And the argument and I've I've, we've been talking about this for a few days because um, uh, one of Mark Levin's friends, who was a former clerk for Chief Justice Warren Burger, was making this argument about the Supreme Court's common writ power and that if, if they believe that there's the possibility that President Trump was deprived of due process, then they can extract this from state court directly to uh, to their court, to the highest court and potentially um, uh, you know, adjudicate the matter. So um, what, what is you know, I, 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 I know it's difficult to sort of ascertain, but um you know, give, give us your perspective on the level of severity here such that an appeal made by Trump's lawyers to the Supreme Court uh, could be taken up before they adjourn June 30th and, and perhaps uh, overturn this conviction straight away before even he's sentenced in July. Well, exactly. The court can reach in and actually stay the sentencing so that New York State can't kind of play any more funny business about things like ankle bracelets and travel restrictions and probation visits and things like that, which you know that that's coming, right? right. Um, the, the most prominent constitutional argument is under the Fifth and Sixth Amendments, which is basically a defendant's right to be informed of the charges against he or she so they can mount a proper defense. And I think that's the, the standout issue there, that from the beginning – This indictment never explained what Donald Trump was charged with. Throughout the trial, it was never actually uh, alliterated until the closing arguments. And then Judge Murchon gives the jury this choice of three different crimes. And as long as any of them apparently are met in the jury's eyes, 
a conviction as possible, and they could mix and match them. So, and we might never find out what the jury's findings were. So you could have three different underlying alleged crimes here, none of which the defense were permitted to defend themselves against. So I think that's the most glaring among at least half a dozen different issues here. Well, and it's particularly important, too, just a a postscript on that, talking about Bradley Smith, the former FEC commissioner who was on Trump's witness list but wasn't called because of the constraints that uh, Merchant put on the uh, allowable questioning uh, for Smith were he to be called. But but, um, that predicate crime that, as you said, we found out in the 11th hour in the prosecution's closing argument, it, it, would, it was not material to the 2016 election. So it, that's the predicate crime that uh, was uh, the, the, crim- the criminal conspiracy to defraud people of an honest election in 2016 that Alvin Bragg was talking about. But even if you treat the Stormy Daniels payment as a uh, campaign expense, Trump would not have had to report that campaign expense until after the 2016 election under the law. So it's totally yep. immaterial. Spot on, Dan, and that's exactly right, and that's exactly the kind of thing that Trump's witness could have explained, was that even if you assume, even if you take for granted that this was a campaign contribution, which I think is nonsensical, had it been declared as such, it would not have been reported until January of 2017, two months after the election. So there's no way this could have affected the election. And I'm sure, and again, maybe I'm giving the jury a little too much credit, I'm trying to be deferential here, but had they heard that, that would have undercut Bragg's most signif- most the strongest of his three extremely weak predicate crimes. I think that should have eviscerated. That should have been the end of that string. And instead, my guess is that's what's most likely happened here, is that the jury hooked on to the federal campaign finance violation. Um, but again, the problem is, since we don't know yeah. which of the three crimes they went with, it'll be hard to identify that on appeal now. Well, I, so, I, I, I still think that I, th- I think they convicted him because uh, on 34 counts of not liking him. But um, but 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 right. We don't know. But we do know to, the, to this point that that Fifth Amendment claim that uh, they could make before the Supreme Court is a particularly compelling one. And the facts that we were just talking about make it that much more compelling. I think that's absolutely right. I mean, I, I think that. Before you even get to the intricacies of what we were just talking about, the mechanics of how the law works and the impact on the, on, on, on the election and things like that, I think that constitutional issue is, is key here. Um, there's others, too. There's the fact that New York managed to, to, to retroactively extend the statute of limitations here. So what should have been a five-year statute of limitations was retroactively made a six-year, which allowed Alvin Bragg to charge this in 2023. For actions that happened in 2017, that's questionable right there. Um, There's a number of others, but I mean, I think you're right. That Fifth and Sixth Amendment, uh, and maybe a Fourteenth Amendment due process argument. I think those are the most prominent. That's what the Trump team has to run with. And I hope the U.S. Supreme Court will show some common sense here and reach in because you're not going to get it from the New York State courts. Let's face it. and what's unfortunate, though, is then, of course, now we're going to shift to a, a war against the U.S. Supreme Court, right? That'll be the next battle. That'll be this, they'll say this is partisan. They'll say they're, they're helping out a fellow Republican. So we're going to go from, like, the flame to the fire here. But unfortunately, it's where we are. Well, I think it's only a matter of time before we hear from one of the jurors. And if you ha- could sit down and ask them any questions, what would it be? I, it would be, what did you understand the alleged crime to be. In plain English, what do you think happened? And what do you base that understanding on? Is it Michael Cohen's testimony? Is it the, uh, is it the documentation? And also, where do you think the testimony of Stormy Daniels actually fit? Because that's another egregious violation there. The fact that that was all even allowed is completely, completely irrelevant what happened allegedly in 2006 versus accounting entries in 2017. And the fact that she was allowed to get up there and then in such graphic detail recount her allegations of what may have happened with Donald Trump, that alone should have ended the trial. The fact that Murchon allowed that was absolutely unconscionable. Uh, What do you say to people, um, especially since you're, you know, an officer of the court, former federal prosecutor, DOJ, what do you say to people who say, uh, I have no faith in the criminal justice system, particularly under this president and 
frankly, if I live in a big city under my current district attorney either. I have no confidence, no faith. I think the whole thing, I think the whole system is rigged and, uh, and is illegitimate. What, what, what do you say to that criticism? Dan, I would say I, I understand that point of view, and, and I would just say that we gotta, we got to have faith that we're better than this, that we're, let's hope this is a bad instance, let's hope that this is corrected, and let's hope that this does not happen again. And, and, and I have to maintain faith that ultimately this will be called out and fixed, because if we go down that rabbit hole of believing that the system is just cooked, that's not a bad path. That's not a good path to go down. So I'd, I'd say hopefully cooler heads will prevail. This will be called out for the political uh, stunt that it was, um, and hang in there. And I, I, give, I give Donald Trump a lot of credit. I can't imagine how many other people could just get out there and maintain that stamina and maintain that focus that he's going to run and win the presidency after all that's happened to him. I give him a tremendous amount of credit. Joseph Moreno, former federal prosecutor with DOJ in the National Security Division, a former staff member with the FBI's 9-11 Review Commission, and a U.S. Army combat veteran. Joseph Moreno, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Dan. Good to be with you. Thank you. And he joined us on our turnkey.pro answer line. Listen to Dan and Amy on your smartphone. Download the AM560 mobile app today at 560theanswer.com slash mobile. This is a special alert to all the